I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, the speakers that we have here. Uh, the first speaker will be um, Uluwole Olutola of the University of Johannesburg, where you are a postdoctoral research fellow. Um, and uh, your area of specialization covers the politics of climate change, uh, with particular focus on South Africa, uh, also the rest of Africa. And, uh, well, you've published quite a bit on this uh, field. Um, your paper is um, Africa EU Climate Change Partnership and a Need for Further Climate Action. So please uh, let us hear whether there is need or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. sense is to mobilize a uh, wide range of support for global climate action. And just uh, three months after, in December 2019, of course, sorry, three months after, in December 2019, the yearly conference of parties, that's COP25, was also uh, held. Of course, this uh, held in furtherance of the Paris Agreement. And, uh, it's the essence uh, was to serve as a launch pad for significantly uh, more climate uh, ambition. Uh, these two summits uh, concluded with the convergence of resolutions uh, calling for more climate uh, ambition and of, of course climate uh, action. Uh, this uh, should be in line with the Paris Agreement and of course the UN 2030 uh, Sustainable Development uh, Agenda. Uh, the implication of all of this uh, is that both the past efforts and of course the current effort uh, remain inadequate and probably uh, not enough you know, to deal with the challenge of climate change. Uh, doing this, uh, I grapple with two uh, research questions that what extent does the call for more climate action apply uh, to Africa and the EU? in the context of the existing climate change uh, relationship between the two uh, continental powers. And if that be the case, what further climate action and strategies uh, are required? Uh, the uh, paper here relies entirely on secondary uh, sources uh, that have been uh, purposely selected for this uh, research, and of course, content analysis. Uh, currently, uh, there is the Paris Agreement, which was struck in 2015 December, after uh, more than two decades of uh, 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 <coughs> negotiation struggle within the global climate change process. And essentially, parties under under this agreement, parties commit to peg the global average temperature to uh, two degrees Celsius above industrial levels, and if possible, further down to 1.5. Uh, degree sessions, you know, also above the uh, industrial levels. And a key strategy to achieve this is what is referred to as nationally determined uh, contributions, uh, under which each party is expected to come up with a uh, mitigation plan on how to, to achieve the Paris Agreement uh, goal. 
Uh, currently, uh, these emission uh, pledges, as we have uh, under the NDCs, uh, appear not enough to deliver the Paris Agreement mitigation goal. Uh, even the whole of assemblage of it. Uh, and to achieve this goal, uh, carbon emissions must reduce to about 45% and net zero by 2030 and 2050 respectively. The US has indicated its intention to withdraw from uh, further participating in the Paris Agreement. Uh, this is expected to take effect uh, this 2020. Actually, there's no exact, uh, there, there's no uh, conclusion yet as to the exact implications of this uh, withdrawal decision. But there are concerns around uh, uh, whether or not this year's uh, withdrawal decision represents you know, an opportunity or a setback for the Paris Agreement in particular, or the global climate uh, action in general. It is also of concern that, uh, I did put a deep, that the US decision will represent a potential damage in terms of uh, the effort to mobilize uh, uh, finance you know, around the uh, climate change. So or whatever it is, it is important to note that Collective effort beyond the United Nations Federal Convention on Climate Change will be required to deal with this. It's not just something that will happen within the uh, UNFCC uh, framework. Why this uh, uh, was the scenario that the global level, then the, we have with the world experienced the case of the two global climate summits, like I've mentioned before, the Euro Climate uh, Action Summit. Uh, under the summit, uh, certain objectives were to be uh, to be achieved, and this will be achieved through a set of transformative uh, initiatives, for which all the stakeholders, both the state and non-state actors, will be held responsible. Uh, the summit also succeeded in having a steering committee to you know, provide strategic gu uh, guidance and oversight of its activities, and of course also to uh, major uh, advisory groups, the science uh, group and the ambition group to provide technical assistance. Uh, but the summit failed to secure concrete and immediate increased mitigation pledges, especially from the uh, biggest world uh, emitters. Uh, on, this as on the side of the core, of course, uh, it was to serve, like I said, as a platform for the operationalization of the Paris Agreement. And during the summit, uh, the Climate Action Alliance was presented. But this uh, presentation uh, is, no, is, is uh, nothing more than you know, a, a recapitulation of the transformative initiatives that were you know, agreed during the United Nations uh, uh, summit. So uh, I mean, the, the COP25, more or less, is not a good complementarity of the the moment already said by the UN uh, Climate Action Summit, as little or no progress uh, was uh, required. Again, it exacerbated the concern that the existing NDCs, uh, even if met, will not be enough to deliver the Paris mitigation uh, goal. While, let me also state that if this COP, the COP, the, uh, COP 25 also had the same challenge of. Uh, bringing about increased mitigation pledges, just as the, uh, uh, the United Nations Action Summit could not uh, uh, also achieve that. So, but while all of this uh, happened, uh, shortly before the end of the COP25, the EU came up with what is referred to as the European uh, Green Deal. Uh, and it just uh, it, it, it speaks to the plan of the EU to you know, uh, work towards reducing uh, the union's uh, emission, especially to achieve net zero by 2050. And under the deal, it is expected that about 25% of the EU budget will be, you know, uh, committed to climate-related uh, objectives. So that's, that reminds us of uh, 
uh, the leading role that the EU has been playing you know, in the global climate change process uh, over the years. And of course, it also brings us to the question of the uh, uh, climate change relationship between uh, EU and Africa. So we look at these two uh, partners as uh, key uh, stakeholders in the climate change process. Uh, Africa is at the center of any discussion uh, around climate change, uh, you know, uh, given that first Africa is a core victim of the climate change uh, adverse impact. Then of course it has been said that Africa has low capacity to respond to the challenge of climate change. So but uh, the EU, Africa EU climate change uh, partnership, uh, we can look at it from two perspectives. We can look at it from their collaboration, uh, working together within the uh, uh, UNFCC framework or the global climate change process. Then you can also, we can also look at it from uh, the perspective of the two partners working together to deal with the climate change problem, specifically in Africa. And that is the focus of so, uh, climate change and the environment is one of the key priorities uh, under the Joint Africa Strategy that was uh, put together in 2007. Africa and EU uh, climate change partnership has, of course, over the years achieved and they've made some significant uh, 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 progress in terms of uh, the Thoughts or the stories you know, around it. But unfortunately, uh, the partnership has also suffered uh, some of us share from some of the challenges facing. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the climate change partnership, particularly, has suffered from some of the challenges uh, that uh, the uh, partnership in general. Like, for instance, uh, uh, some of them have been mentioned uh, in the previous. Uh, uh, presentation, uh, the problem of uh, unequal uh, status or uh, perception of unequal status in partnership, uh, the question of cumbersome, you know, structure, uh, the question of mistrust, especially from the African, uh, the way they, then of course also look at the, the, the deficiency in terms of political way, I think these are, these are some of the problems. And Africa EU climate change partnership also uh, is not immune, you know, from from these uh, problems. And given that our situation, Africa and the EU uh, will need to work more closely together to be able to address uh, these challenges. And in my own conclusion, I uh, come up with uh, key policy insights. Uh, one that the Call for more climate action is, is, is a global question. It's not just a question for the EU and Africa. However, uh, EU and Africa, it provides EU and Africa uh, a, a, a fresh opportunity to reassess the climate change uh, partnership that is already in existence between the two. Africa and the EU uh, will also need to take, given their uh, uh, strategic uh, importance to the Whole question of climate change. The two, the two partners will need to take the lead in bringing uh, the current approach uh, in their partnership into alignment with the UN transformative initiatives on the global climate uh, action. And of course, the Paris uh, Agreement as well. The two partners uh, will need to commit to a more climate change agenda and joint implementation and framework that not only support the UN transformative initiatives. But it's also, but also consistent with the mitigation goal of the Paris Agreement. Africa and the EU climate change must be well positioned to complement the effort of the UN uh, Standing Committee on the Global Climate Action, uh, specifically in providing strategic uh, guidance and oversight for activities of African states to enable them <coughs> to achieve uh, or fulfill uh, the pledges they have made under the transformative. Uh, initiatives and where possible of course provide financial and technical uh, support to this African state. And then lastly African solutions to the continent climate change challenges uh, will need to be encouraged but with shared responsibility and a truly collective uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you.
Kuku Gyu, who um, is a uh, postgraduate student of the Double Masters in Asian and European Affairs uh, MA program at both Redmond University of China and King's College London. Um, so talking about bringing regions uh, together, I don't know if it's comparative regionalism <laughs> or uh, regionalization, actually. Um, she's already co-published a book and um, two articles on Chinese foreign affairs. And um, she's now going to speak to us about from connectivity to convergence, city diplomacy between China and Europe. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Xu Jing Liu. Um, I'm a double master program a student, postgraduate student in King's College of London and Durham University uh, of China. And I finished my first uh, postgraduate year study uh, in China. And second year of this program. And today I'm going to talk about the city diplomacy. Uh, I changed the, the title a little bit because uh, my previous panel has gone. And <laughs> I just moved to this panel. Um, so here I really want to uh, focus on the city diplomacy itself. Actually, I have little knowledge about Africa and EU relations. Sorry about that. So the uh, uh, title of this presentation is about from connectivity to convergence, city diplomacy in international relations. And my argument is that the, connect, the connectivity of cities uh, can be a soft but effective way to facilitate the convergence of, uh, of nations. So this is the structure of my presentation. In order to uh, demonstrate my uh, argument, uh, I need to Okay, I need to first answer these three questions and then reach the conclusion. So on the in the background part, um, so first I'd like to say why I would like to focus on cities. Uh, I suppose the recently the most hard, uh, frequently heard city name is Wuhan in China. <laughs> I'm really sorry about <laughs> the, the world knows Wuhan in this way. But uh, you know what? Uh, what's the name uh, for Chinese people recently? Uh, I mean, the Chinese people most recently heard it's Oita. It's a Japanese city, uh, and it is also the twin city of Wuhan uh, because at the very initial stage of this uh, epidemic, uh, this city, the, the city of Oita, has sent uh, Wuhan uh, thirty thousand facial masks. And it was reported widely, both in Chinese media and uh, Japanese, me uh, Japanese media. Mm -hmm. uh, so just it, it, it's just as what the uh, former, uh, admin, former, former, uh, former official to uh, American official to uh, NATO said: cities are playing a significant role in addressing many global challenges from climate change mm -hmm. to pandemics. And uh, in 2008, uh, there was also a report about Global Urban Competitiveness Report. Uh, it's about the cities uh, embedded in the global value chain. Uh, so in this report, it said that cities become more uh, global and networked in the past uh, four, uh, four decades. So from these two uh, scenarios, we could say that uh, cities has become a more significant role in the international community, and uh, the cities can uh, indeed do something uh, to achieve its own goal, like uh, develop itself in uh, economically and uh, political work, politically. Um, so here, second one, let's talk about why connectivity matters. Uh, this shows a. Uh, uh, this diagram is from a book called uh, Connectography. It was uh, written by Park Connor, an American uh, strategist. And uh, he says that um, in the past, at the very, at very initial stage, the uh, geography is shifted by many uh, natural items like the rivers, like mountains. And then when the uh, states uh, become coming to be, uh, it becomes the political geography. And uh, nowadays, because of many technologies, many other factors, uh, the world became to connect it uh, functionally. 
And here, uh, this picture shows the lights at night of all over the world. And we could see the uh, outline of the most uh, prosperous areas rather than the nations. And just as what I mentioned before, nowadays, big data and 5Gs, many other new um, advanced technologies also coming to be. So it also shaped the international relations. And on the national <coughs> level, uh, many uh, significant economics like the European Union and China, both of them has propo have proposed uh, some official documents about connectivity strategies in China, like Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, for European Union, connecting Europe and Asia, building blocks for the EU strategies. And uh, uh, in both of these articles, they also emphasize the city to city exchange uh, and uh, cooperation. So here it comes to the major questions. So is it possible to achieve convergence of states through connectivity of cities? So in order to answer this question, uh, I just uh, divide it into three uh, sub-questions. So first, uh, what is city diplomacy? So uh, Jim Tennyson is the was the first scholar to propose uh, this term, city diplomacy. So he, uh, it, it is defined as the institutions and the processes by which cities or local governments in general, in general engage in relations with actors on an international political stra uh, stage with the main aim of presenting themselves and their interests to one another. And there's another book about uh, called Social Power in International Politics. So in this book, uh, the author uh, just uh, call, uh, regarded the cities as an um, in-between power. Uh, because uh, for cities and many other local authorities, it not only connected the uh, local communities, the publics, but also in a, a larger governmental system. And if we get back to the history of the cities in global context, uh, we could see like Roman, like uh, Athens, they are the uh, earliest uh, city states or polis. Uh, and then uh, after the Western Berlin system, uh, the sovereign uh, countries, sovereign nations coming to be. And so at that time, uh, cities become the significant part of the nations <coughs> and they uh, could not conduct the diplomatic issues like war, like peace. And then uh, around the, uh, after the First World War, because uh, the first uh, international friendship city uh, was built between uh, the city in France and Britain. And then uh, around 1993, I suppose, I, sorry, uh, uh, and there are, become, uh, there are international organizations of cities uh, it was called, it is the first uh, organization about cities. It was called uh, International Union of Local Authorities. And just as what I mentioned here, uh, Jim Ellison in 2007 uh, proposed uh, this term in uh, uh, media. Uh, so when we talk about uh, cities <coughs> in the international uh, interaction, uh, we need to think about its legal personality international legal personality. Uh, so actually, just as what I mentioned, cities become more and more uh, important in international interactions. But actually, nowadays, uh, in, according to international law, cities uh, do not have the uh, international legal personalities. So there is a paradox, in fact. And uh, so city diplomacy, uh, actually, it's a kind of uh, gray zone. Uh, and I suppose that's the reason why there are many uh, practices in reality, but uh, uh, seldom theoretical explanations about city diplomacy. So here comes to the second question. How do cities connect the world? Um, here I uh, classify the practice about cities uh, here in this chart. So um, uh, <coughs> bilateral relations uh, in regional and a global, uh, global uh, context, uh, the major uh, practices about international friendship cities. 
And uh, for the multilateral relations, here I uh, selected two uh, cases about the impact of green cities and the international urban cooperations. There are some details. So first about uh, the friendship cities. Um, I here I have two uh, examples about uh, Changchun in China and uh, Birmingham in the UK. Uh, because this, uh, this topic was also my uh, topic about uh, for my undergraduate undergraduate dissertation, so I just uh, did some research and uh, I sent the email to the uh, official uh, in Birmingham City uh, Council and asked the why they just uh, uh, build these friendship relations. And I got the reply that because these two cities are famous for its uh, car industries, because of this, uh, because of this industry, so they decided to build uh, the friendship relations in 1983. And another uh, case is about uh, Xi'an in China and Leon in Spain. I had the opportunity to uh, go to to go to uh, Spain last year, and I did an interview to, uh, with some officials and also found some uh, documents in Chinese. And I found, apart from the uh, governmental exchange, uh, most of the uh, interactions between these two cities about people-to-people -people exchange. And then it's about the uh, pact of free cities. Uh, it was signed by four uh, cities of um, <coughs> Brat Wasson, uh, Wasson Bratislava is from uh, Czech, Czech. <laughs> and uh, no, Budapest, Slo Slovakia. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Slovakia. <laughs> and uh, Budapest. And for this pack, in, it's also talking about climate change, uh, human, uh, human rights, democracy. But what most important is that it also um, talked about to uh, decry the populism in Europe, and uh, it reflects the uh, e EU uh, values on self-nation level. And uh, then the last scenario, it's about the uh, international urban cooperation. So in 2017, um, this was the first uh, time for the EU to cooperate directly with cities and the regions. Uh, and this program is called International Urban Cooperation and uh, reflecting the EU urban agenda as well as the new urban agenda of the United Nations. So based on these three scenarios, we can have a, a brief conclude that for bilateral relations between cities, uh, they are mainly based on the similar industries or, or common interests and uh, it's mainly about the people-to-people -people exchange and for multilateral relations uh, it talked about some low politics, about climate change, about human rights and democracy so uh, last question what will connectivity bring about um, actually my uh, framework uh, is mainly based on this theory, uh, relational, relational theory, and it was proposed by Xin Aqing, a Chinese uh, professor in international relations. Um, he just proposed the two very traditional Chinese um, concepts, one is guanxi, and the other is uh, process, and he supposed process is the guanxi emotion. Um, he supposed the three main uh, string international relations relation theories, structural relation, uh, realism, constructi uh, constructivism, and uh, new uh, liberalism, both, uh, all of this uh, ignore one important po point, that is the uh, process. Uh, so here, uh, Professor Qing just uh, emphasized this point and uh, built his uh, theory. So for bilateral relations, here, I suppose the city diplomacy can trigger the relationship between the cities and uh, um, the social interactions between the international uh, friendship cities uh, on, the first, on the one hand can create the norms and the rules and then with the institutionalized the exchange mainly, uh, between the governments and then uh, it makes the uh, practices between the cities more acceptable uh, expectable and this can also drive 
the uh, process of social interaction between the twin cities. And on the other hand, uh, this, inter this kind of interaction can broaden the identity and the sentiments between the uh, cities, and they can realize that their uh, com complementary uh, cooperation fields. And uh, in this kind of fields, uh, the transaction costs can be lowered. And so based on these two wells, uh, they just uh, strengthened mutually, and this can shape the national image. And uh, just now I mentioned the Changchun and uh, mm, Birmingham, and he said uh, here. And uh, uh, the other case I mentioned before, the Japan and uh, China, Wuhan and uh, all Oita, uh, you know, uh, Japan in this corona break, coronavirus breakout in, in China, uh, it's main, I suppose his, uh, its image become really, really positive. And for the multilateral relations, I suppose for cities, they just uh, create uh, the organizations to uh, be acknowledged by the traditional main international actors, that is the states. And on this platform, uh, the cities can just uh, learn and teach uh, each other. And this is also the main uh, arguments from the social constructivism in international relations series. So last, the conclusion. So on the one hand, uh, subnational actors like cities have played a more active role in bilateral relations and created the uh, technology of the international organizations as platforms connecting civil society and global affairs in multilateral relations. Uh, I admit that the functions are limited compared with the traditional international actor states, but uh, we cannot deny that they play more and more important role in recent days. And for another, compared with the cities in China and uh, Africa, cities in many European countries with the feature of strong society and weak uh, government can make more adva advantage of their civil strengths. Um, we have to say that the European here, the European cities here, uh, can be seen as the front runners. So that I, can, I suppose that the Chinese cities and the African cities can learn something from this. And here's the references and thank you for attention. And actually, <laughs> uh, this is also my topic for my postgraduate dissertation. And if possible, I also want to um, keep working on it uh, in the future study. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so please give me some advice, uh, even the critics. So thank you very much. <laughs>